Hello, and welcome to Kristoff. I'm Happy Chthonian. Today I'm sharing an adventure that I wrote, the latest publication from Happy Chthonian called Glitch Spire. It's a one-page affair, one-page dungeon. It's kind of cheating because it's one page front and back. Um, so I'll be doing a little walkthrough, showing you all the goodies and gobbies that it has to gibble and go in, uh, you know, rooms and stuff. Uh, random tables. Uh, <laughs> now that you've seen my face, I'm going to channel Ben Milton and we're just going to put it on the table and you'll just see my hands for the rest of it. Uh, but it is me. I do have hands. Okay. Glitch Spire, a system neutral adventure set in the ultraviolet grasslands, but it should work in any dying earth or post 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 apocalyptic setting. It uses a map by Dyson Logos. Uh, this is on DysonLogos.blog, as many of his wonderful maps are. All of them. I don't know. A bunch of maps. Uh, this one's free for commercial use. Thank you, and thanks to his wonderful patrons. Uh, it's called Shattered Tower on there. There'll be links in the video description. Now, it's got creatures and elements from Ultraviolent Grasslands, so it's going to refer to actual creatures there and places and things like that. But you can fill in your own stuff if you're putting it into your own world. That's with uh, permission from the great Lucarets. Uh, if you want another dungeon, you can go to bit.ly slash HPPYCHTH News, Happy Chthonian, and I've got another free dungeon there with its own secret video. It is a spire of alloyed marble swirl obsidian and bone. That's my kind of like, what does everything look like? What does each room look like? How tall is everything as it lights? Uh, I don't know about all that, but it's definitely marble swirled obsidian and bone. That's kind of the flavor for everything else. Two big pieces of context here in the NPCs slash context area. Uh, that kind of explains the story of what's going on in this tower. There's Katyu Samethyst. She's a ghost. Well, not really a ghost. She's a person who's trapped in time in the tower and she kind of haunts it. And if you roll on the table and get Katyu Samethyst, then she appears and you interact with her. She... Is kind of confused about being lost across time. She's in denial. She doesn't want to uh, admit she's lost or trapped there. She doesn't know it, but her chronomancers back in the day locked her there because, uh, yeah, they're treacherous wizards who doesn't love a Jafar. Uh, so she's there, kind of a major character, and a lot of the rooms hint at her or kind of tell her story. Uh, Hesseline is at the top of the tower, unless you encounter her earlier with the encounter table, uh, but she's a hedge wizard and vine druid who has a reason to be here because the tower is all timey-wimey and uh, the chronomancers have kind of locked this person there and changed the way time works around there. She's using it to stall this terrible curse that's like twisting her. She's already looks kind of like a beetle and it's just going to get worse. So she's staying there because she has important work to do. She thinks she has a cure for like the vomes in your video, which is basically uh, mechanical zombies, digital zombies. Uh, so she can find a cure for that. And she really can. If you meet her and talk with her, you know, she can tell you where to get the cure. And if you get that thingy, uh, that MacGuffin, it's the brain case of source fact Johnny Seven, which is an NPC, but you could switch in your own MacGuffin. If you bring it back, then she works for 1d10 weeks, give you a bunch of spells, astral projection, time pause meditation, and then a 50-50 chance of either making a spray, like an anti-zombie, an anti vom spray, or going crazy and, you know, binding the insanity of this MacGuffin to a terrible uh, vehicle and wreaking havoc throughout your campaign world. So that's fun. Uh, there's a lot of little things littered in here like that that just could go one way, could go another. Let's dive in. Now, there are 13 floors, and the numbers of the floors, uh, <laughs> that's a three, the numbers of these floors are on the side here, and then the room numbers correspond to the floor. So the two rooms on the first floor are 1.1, the People's Meat Market, and 1.2, the ruined food stores, those correspond to the one here. Uh, some things refer back to, like, those NPCs I talked about, Hesseline, uh, and they're in teal because it's a reference back to this teal kind of page. Big things that players will see as soon as they come up are outside, the fact that there's no walls, and the fact that there's a giant web up here. So 
So outside, there are a few NPCs. Rouge Lombardo is a disowned trust fund baby, and he's inherited the deed to this tower from his uncle, who's the only family member who could stand him. With him, he has Rambatan, is a warrior princess, his loyal bodyguard, and uh, unhappy girlfriend. And he has two inept wizards, Horny and Corny, no relation. They're hanging out in a clamshell top bucket seat road yacht. Uh, which is a nice bit of treasure. So that's kind of them out there, and of course they want help clearing out the tower. Uh, you can see there are no walls if you actually go up there. There are invisible razor-sharp webs that are holding the tower up, so it might get cut if you're playing around there or trying to sneak in through there. And there is a spider person, kind of like the Scorpion King, hanging out up here. And he's territorial and spits fatigue-causing poison, so he might hawk deadly loogies down on you and give you exhaustion. But there's a bunch of riches in here. There's an etched rhino horn, a bunch of jade coins, an accordion that he stole from Rouge, so Rouge might want you to go get that. Fun stuff right away. And we'll go through the rest of these rooms. Uh, before diving in, El Spidre, the giant spider, and other uh, creatures have this purple coloration, and down here it says purple. Those are NPCs. So ideally, if you're looking for where the creatures and the monsters are, you can just kind of focus on the purple things. If you're looking for the things, you got to look on the other side here. And then the other things in the key are green U's tell you what goes up, and red D's tell you what goes down in terms of stairs. Uh, there are a bunch of, there's a spiral staircase going up many of these floors, and then there are some rope ladders that uh, look like this little symbol. If you look at it for a little bit, you'll kind of figure it all out. And then teleporters go between these two floors. I digress! Now this is a system neutral adventure, so all of the creatures, like we'll look at El Spidre and his giant web, it just says L6, and down here it says what is L, L is level, or hit dice, or challenge rating, or whatever. You know, if you're using OSE, there's a HD table for all the monsters, if you're using 5e, I recommend something like uh, the Lazy Dungeon Master's latest Make Your Own Monster book as a great table for CR. You can just look up a CR and then you know everything, all the stats, everything you need. Uh, or if you're using a simpler system, you can just use the level. I use level to mean that's how many hits it takes until the thing's dead. <laughs> and PC's level, uh, same thing. Yeah, all right. You're going up to this tower. What's on the first floor? The People's Meat Market is what the sign says. There's a bloody altar where the meat was and a mosaic of the War Queen. That's the first hint of Hesseline, the War Queen here. Or, I mean, Kat Samethist, the War Queen. they are biomechanical roots, level three. They'll try to nab your gear. And if you cut them, then it's kind of like alien. You don't want to cut it because then the blood shoots out at you. And in this case, the blood makes you sick and kind of wretch for 10 minutes. Uh, uh, uh. 10 minutes is an important number because every 10 minutes, classic old school Renaissance uh, adventure style, there is a random happenings table. So let's say you're in room one and you're getting all sick and you're puking for 10 minutes and you're puking so loud that something hears it and we roll... A nine means the ghost of Al Gore Suwati, Katu's gesture, appears. And he is, there's four different options for what he's doing with you. Yeah? Three, he's drawing a mustache on a tricolor poster of Katu. Maybe in this case, I'd say he's drawing a mustache on that mosaic in the first floor. So kind of a Peeves type character hanging out around here as well. And as long as we're on this side, there's also a rumor table. Start the party with one, add more to taste. So maybe the party are coming in and they know six aerolithic towers. <sighs> Just watch out for stuck force. Seen people get cut in half by it. Kind of a warning about the invisible walls here. So aerolithic, if it's stone that's just hanging in midair, watch out for that. And there are other clues and goodies maybe we'll look at. Second thing, ruined food stores. There are kegs and stalls, a statue, and hummingberry bushes that are worth some money. Uh, the statue, again, shows you that war queen, just kind of showing that theme. Up to the second store where there is a library with a plush throne, but it's trapped. There's a whoopee cushion filled with a uh, rage gas. So if you breathe it in, you might go berserk and start attacking your friends. There's books uh, with lovely snakeskin binding. And, for instance, you might get book number five, Katusa Amethyst's journal. Tells you that she was an outcast, a war queen, a conqueror, a time traveler, and is trapped in the tower. 
nice little lore tie-in. And there's some other fun stuff like an insect cookbook you know, or a scroll that teleports you to a far-off location. Go up the stairs and the next room has a chained gladiator tapestry. Uh, it is a gladiator who begs the party to kill Sakatu's Amethyst. He can speak. Uh, he's freaking out. And if you do, then he can join the party. He's a great interrogator, but he's naked. He has no gear. Then there's a storeroom with a wood crate. I've played this. Uh, there's a link down below to a playthrough where a party went through. And they almost didn't look at the wood crate in this random storeroom, which is the best treasure in the whole dungeon. It's just worth 25000 uh, the crystalline needle feathers of a giant ultraviolet bird. So uh, it was really fun when they almost were about to leave the room and they're like, is there anything else? Well, there's that wood crate. They cracked it open and realized what they almost missed. Then there's a fun magic item, crystal scales, that when you look in them, you see what's up above you. And if you like tilt and look at someone else and make eye contact with them, then you see their dream. You see their last dream. So that's a really funky one. When we played through this, someone used that to look into Katyus Amethyst's mind, and uh, uh, that's how they kind of beat the boss, was by learning about her inner child through her dream. Um, that's how I like to roll. We go up to number four. There's a mech roost with mech roost, a roost for mechs, biomechanical hovering stinging jellyfish porcupines. Uh, and when they sting, they drain your ka or your intelligence. Uh, speech agitates them, so if you talk at them, they might uh, r run away. There's also a spell pewter with three spells, rats to clams, ferment, rat milk, and uh, regeneration, but the regeneration spell doesn't actually work. Uh, it just makes you think you're regenerating. In the forge, there's an anvil and a laser, classic for forging things, and an uh, NPC named Oriano. He's a bounty hunter sent to get Hesseline uh, because she's that hedge wizard and she's kind of, it says here, she was working with the Vomes, the weird digital zombies, and people don't like that. She brought some into the civilization, got some people sick. Now there's a bounty out on her head. That's why he's there, and while he's there, he's repairing his broken net gun. Uh, could be a fun uh, enemy or friend or frenemy. There's an armory with two spears, keening, made of crystal. They can harm ghosts in substantial things. And there is a gun rack. Mimic! It looks like a gun rack. It actually has a bullet spray breath. <laughs> oh, that was fun. Um, let's say you're going up the dungeon and, you know, you've made it this far and some time has passed and it's time to roll a random happening. What else do we got on this table? An eight. So that's a pretty common result. It's a bell curve of 2d6. So two, that is not going to happen very often. 12, not going to happen very often. Those are kind of game-changing ones. Eight happens, uh, should happen frequently. And it's Katu, Samethyst herself. She appears, and if she is killed, her body and gear fade away, and she may appear again. She's trapped in time, so she can keep kind of popping up. Whew. Now, above this floor is floor number five, which is one big room, the Time Lost Stone Tavern. Ruined wind might go through and uh, make someone topple and fall to their doom. Always nice. And there are echoes of long-ago gossip, which change depending on the role. In this instance, it's one and three, so they hate abmortal accretions. Have fun with that. Very UVG style thing to have to make sense of. You hear whispers, there are people here, ah, the abmortals, always pushing their pollution into the world and giving rise to God knows what. Uh, something like that. Go up to here, and a, this is an interesting room. There's a pit that you'd have to vault uh, if you get up to this level. There's a little storage room with a map of the region and debris, but if you jump over here, there are more murals of Katyu in the propaganda room, which also has book bins with a bunch of pamphlets of uh, propaganda. And there are some from the future, because this tower has been going back and forth through time. Uh, and in the next room, there's a salon. So there are three chairs with the you know little things that go over your head if you're doing a perm, and there's sinks and scissors for the person. And there are four venom rats playing in an overturned hairdryer. It's nice to have rats. It might be a chance to use rats to clams spell. Next is floor number seven, the winery. 
Uh, these fountains once ran with wine, but now they're dry. And they have cherubs on them, but they're mantis cherubs on the fountains. And there's a moldy wine puddle out of which comes a spore guardian, an existentially anxious sort of uh, spore creature. On the balcony, there's debris and then some random mundane items, a corkscrew, some wine, some vinegar. Uh, up here, I imagine with an existentially anxious spore guardian, you know, you could kind of talk to it about meaning in life and then it would get afraid and run away or blow up or something. If you go up from here, there's this little area where it just looks like a staircase and there's a secret uh, door behind a pro one of those agitating propaganda ads of Katusa Amethyst. And in the secret room, which is called the Phoenix Lab. There are four peacocks, uh, and if you free them, like Mewtwo from the Pokemon movie, they say, why was I born? And then they swell and swell with angst, and then they explode, and then they rise from the ashes and repeat. They're just constantly wondering what kind of their purpose in life is. Isn't that great? There's also a hypnotizing evil blue gem worth 1,800 uh, cash. And I'm realizing I didn't talk about the analysis room on floor number three. It's kind of, there's a theme here of some existential psychological fuckery. So on 3.3 is the analysis room. There's a Freud couch and an armchair with a rig, a crystal psych rig. It's a tank of black liquid catharsis and two helmets. Uh, one's a psych and one's an analysand. If you put the helmets on, then the psych can go into the other person's unconscious and see what's there. I thought that was kind of funny. All right. Uh, now to get to 8.2, the map's interesting. You have to go up these stairs, then back over this ladder, and then down to this area. So this is, there are two kind of secret areas on level eight. And in this one, there's a, ske uh, a skeleton hall, hall that's just got skeletons for bricks. There's a bedroom. It's Katu's bedroom, and in it is her dried up mummy corpse. If you encounter Katyu and she sees the corpse, she has to save or check morale each round or she dies forever. So that's the way to finally kill her. Uh, and in this room, you can get her treasure, which is the time rod. It casts haste and slow, but there's a one in six risk for each, every time you cast that you'll get stuck in time, kind of like she is. Uh, and there's a cracked GPU that's uh, basically a sentient magic item that has a master economist naive master economist's brain in it. There's a kitchen with a tile stove that is biomechanical, made of muscle and china, and it might attack you. There's a giant blender, always good, and scrolls create tweel and almond bark skin. All right, up above that is the ballroom. There are more whispers, uh, talking tra tapestries of traitorous mages, the chronomancers. Uh, there are some very heavy but very expensive tables and abstract statues of hardened ooze. There's a platform out here, which is where you can encounter El Spidre, and it contains a rain barrel, uh, but it's time-fouled water, so it might turn you into a sort of stubby, eyeless, pale, pallid creature. Mm -hmm. Up above that... There is the lower teleport. There are H2O kegs where they used to keep water, but they're totally busted. And there's graffiti that says water hog. The idea being that Katyu was, uh, you know, trying to hog all the water and all the resources and dole them out to control this area like a real tyrant. There's a magnetic dais that lets you teleport upwards, but in it is a dust cloud and you have to save or have one of these terrible mutations happen. So let's say we failed the save and getting into that dust cloud to be able to teleport up. You now have a forked tongue and super scent. Nice. Up in here is the upper teleport. There's a gaseous metal cloud that you also have to save uh, or you'll just become silver and you'll be slowed for a bit. This level has several rooms. Out on the big balcony, if you get outside, there's a giant leech with many human arms and four statues uh, that have their heads, you can see they screw off. And if you take those into the hollow library, which is guarded by a flying zombie swordfish with rapier wit, 
there's a hollow projector where you can uh, put the heads in and it will play their memories. So if you were to grab one of those heads, put it in here, you might learn the memories of one of these, the big balcony memory table. Number three, a muscled graffiti artist spraying haikus critical of Katya. So you can see into his memories and get, again, a little more lore about the, the backstory. I like the idea of kind of gradually piecing together the backstory of Katya Samethyst as this big bad time tyrant with all these little hints. There's a locked vault if you can get in. There are highly visible classic alarm lasers that you have to limbo around. Uh, if you mess up and hit those, failure save, then you get a random encounter. Let's roll. A five, so that's not very likely. 1d4 molten bone and obsidian golems mute ooze out of the wall. They are 1d4, a two. They're overjoyed uh, at being born. So that's nice. Not all bad, not all bad. Moving around here, uh, in the vault, uh, there are, there's a spiked pit, and it's easy to avoid, it's just a spiked pit. At the bottom, there's a dead body with a cursed flute. If you play the flute, it conjures a spiked pit before you. So, kind of a joke trap. And there are eight steel chests with musical notation. If you play the music, the chests open, but playing music causes a random encounter check because it's so loud and noisy, right? Some Zelda stuff there with the music opening things. Three and four is a seven. The most common result is 2d4 wicker fetishes controlled by Hesseline. So she's got, the most likely thing you'll encounter is her kind of the, the creatures that serve the lady who's up at the top. And they are, in this case, sweeping. Just sweeping up. All right. Now the eight treasure chests here... When you open them with the, the magic, they're teal, so they're on the back page here. And I'll just talk about one of them. You open the treasure chest and get number six, a painting of a room with silver knights. In their midst stands this tower. A golden door in the wall hints at the location of a gate two days from the tower. So it's like this map that's hidden in the context of the painting. It's also the painting's worth 900 cash. A little info, little treasure, we love it. Finally, on floor number 11 is the closet. There's a mirror, a hat box, a kind of tower of a hat box. If you make it topple a bunch of hat boxes, then that causes another encounter roll because toppling box noises. And the, this random encounter would be number eight. We've already seen Kachi Sam with this. That could happen again. Now, just if you did get a 12, if you got a 12, not likely, Katmarin Taboglio would come on a blimp now, this is Rouge's ex-boyfriend, and he's angry. He's, he's got a uh, flock of monkey parrots and also a scroll of teleport tower. So he teleports the whole tower to another location. It's a nice dungeon transformation. Not totally likely to happen, but if it, it, it's, a, it's in there. It's a possibility. Uh, there's a vast wardrobe in this room full of, like, Clothes from all times. There's Napoleonic, oldie, old timey, chrome formal from the future, fur beach wear, like some kind of weird Flintstones thing. All right, two more floors. This penultimate floor is the Robo Creationist Gallery. There are tapestries of metal faces singing planets into being. They're all worth 500 cash. Now, hidden behind the tapestries are 2d6, two inch tall ambushers, kind of like fairies on locust mounts, very fern gully. They have paralyzing poison, and Katyu shrank them, so they want revenge. If they fail their morale, they don't run away, they fade back into the past. So more of that time theme, more of Katyu. And at the top, the Meditation Garret. There are more vines, they're grabby, made of meat and steel. Hegtrix is the uh, Igor to Hesseline's Frankenstein, an evil lackey in a poncho with dingy briefs. And there's an invulnerability circle in that room where Hesseline meditates in a trance uh, to get her, you know, her, her magic done as she's here to do. Yeah, wow, that's the dungeon. That's it. That's all the rooms. That's the things that's in the rooms. Those are the tables. Uh, there's more. It's free. It's pay what you want. So go to the description and get it. I don't know what else to say. If you made it this whole way, thank you.
and keep happy Chthonian-ing.